All right, guys. We're gonna go ahead and cook up this tomahawk three pound ribeye. It's carnivory, World Carnivore Month, and we are gonna take it straight to it. Uh, I've got some Buffalo Ranch uh, rib tips that are in the crock pot right now. They're finished up. I'm gonna go ahead and pull them out and show you while this is cooking, and we'll get to it. Remember, the carnivore diet is probably the best diet that you can be on for autoimmune conditions diabetic conditions, any kind of thing that you're trying to cleanse and purge from your body. Animal products have the most bioavailable nutrients out there. They don't have to be converted two and three times like plant products do. And you'll get a lot of bad information from the vegans by saying a vegan diet is very cleansing and stuff in general. That is not true. Your body can actually use the nutrients and stuff that come from meat because they're in their first form available to be broken down and used immediately. Or plant matter has to be converted two and three times and a lot of the nutrient density is lost in the process of doing that so in observance of world carnivore month we're going to be cooking more often carnivore type foods and sharing some tips tricks and ways to get through eliminating bad foods and things out of your diet so you can actually start to figure out what's going on with you why is your skin breaking out why are you getting these ro rosacea occurrences often why is the eczema and psoriasis getting worse? Why is your diabetes not getting better? Eliminating the sugary, starchy, fibrous foods from your diet and then going a period of time without that stuff in there can help you start to recover from a lot of that. And by doing so, you can start adding in different types of foods to figure out what are your trigger foods and what are the foods that you actually agree with that don't affect your blood sugar in a you know drastic matter or something like that. And then you can start to build your own basic menu of foods that your body likes without having to spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars getting tested and having people look at you through a lab you can actually do that yourself you can be your own critic your own scientist you can do this your own without having to spend a bunch of money to do it let's get to cooking i'm going to go ahead and oil this pan i had to clean it from the meal that we made earlier I may even have to switch this pan here in a second. This is a three pound tomahawk. It's been sitting out for about an hour and a half, maybe closer to hour and a half, two hours. I salted both sides with some pink Himalayan salt. I've got my pan heating up right now. I'm gonna go ahead and shut it off. And the reason I do that is I let the pan heat up so the pores open in the cast iron. And then I'll go ahead and oil it and let it cool back down slowly and then I'll go ahead and heat it back up and let the pores open up one more time and draw even more oil in. I usually like to use like a duck fat or a saturated fat because saturated fats, they, they don't have double carbon bonds. So uh, when saturated fats heat up, they don't break down or oxidize as easy as vegetable oils, seed oils, and things like that. So along with that oil, I typically like to take some pretty decent salt. This is just pink Himalayan salt. I'm actually got a shipment of uh, Redmond's Real Salt coming. And I'll rub that in with the oil so that salt and that oil will kind of get down in that metal. So as this is cooling down now, now that I got that pan coated in the oil in there, I'm going to let it sit there and do its thing as it starts to cool back down. And then when I heat it back up, open the pores up, I'm going to go ahead and put my steak back in there and let it pull in some of that saturated fat with it and that oily salt. What we have here is we have a pan of... What we've got there is a pan of Buffalo Ranch rib bites. And basically I took some country style ribs and sliced them up real small. Took a jar of Primal Kitchen Ranch and New Primal Buffalo and I just dumped it in there and I've been slowly cooking this. But before I did that, as I took three pounds of that meat, cut it up in small pieces, went ahead and threw a half a stick of butter in the skillet here. I fried it all together and all that rendered fat that came from the pork and the butter, I left it in the bottom of the pan. 
I transferred the pork over to the crock pot and I took my primal ranch and my buffalo sauce and I poured it in the pan and I simmered it up inside there to kind of bring it all together under some heat. And then I went and tossed it into the crock pot with all of the pork and I've just been slowly cooking it since then. So I'm going to pull it out and actually try it now. Here we go. Now, if you're strictly on a carnivore diet, uh, the buffalo ranch, and this is not gonna be your kind of meal, but if you allow yourself some keto style food, some clean type oils and things like that, this would not be a problem. Uh, for January, a lot, this is World Carnivore Month. You know, stuff like these sauces and things like that would not be allowed. The only reason I'm really doing this is because I want to make something every once in a while for me and Ange, just so we can have something outside of carnivore food and she will feel okay because she's not on a carnivore diet like me. Look at that. Just kind of, let me see if I can aim this down some. This stuff just, it's perfect. I'm going to try this. Let me flip this camera around for a second. By the way, I've got my oven on 400 right now. I'm letting it heat up. Flip this around. We're going to try this right now. Oh man, that's good. That's really good. I I did, I covered that in the beginning of the video. You might have missed it, but I said I did salt the, the tomahawk both sides with pink Himalayan salt. So that's something I did do. I've been doing this a little while. I'm not some newbie when it comes to this, so trust me, I, I got this. The tomahawk is salted both sides as well as the pan. Hmm. I'll be having this more often. This this pork is pretty good in this buffalo ranch. So I'm gonna shut that off now. Well, let's get started on this tomahawk. This bone is not going to fit in the pan, so I'm going to have to try to adjust it around because this bone is so big. Or if I had a sawzall, I'd cut it down or get a bigger skillet, but unfortunately this is what I'm working with right now. Hey, you want to try this? This buffalo? And Ange. What? You want to try this? Oh, yeah. Man. That is good. get to let this get nice and hot before I even put that tomahawk in there because I want to sear it real good first. I'm going to sear it here on both sides and then I'm going to stick it in the oven for about 8 to 10 minutes and let it bake at 400. With these thicker pieces of meat like this, that's just what I like to do. But if they were a regular steak that would fit in that skillet just fine, I wouldn't do any of that. I would, uh, I would just straight you know, five to six minutes on each side, maybe a little bit less. But this is so thick that I'm going to need to bake it a little bit because I don't want it super, super red inside. You know, more like a blue rare is fine, but I don't want super, super rare. Like, like blue, like bloody blue. Thank you. 
Mmm. That is just really, really, really good. That's the first time I ever made that. I use the same concept as I use for uh, It's good. Yeah. Not super hot. That's good. And tender. I like that. Yeah, it's good. <coughs> and you know what you could also make that? What we made with the, the mandel. Oh yeah. You could throw a you could throw a block of cream cheese in those um and uh, the pork rib tips and shred it up some and uh, let that cream cheese thicken up the, the rib tip juice and shred all that and you can turn it into dip for like pork rinds. I'm gonna go ahead and set this for, it's probably been in there what about, I would think somewhere around two or three minutes now, maybe a little bit more. So I'm gonna put the timer on for another, I'll let it sit for another three minutes on the other on the side right now, and then I'm gonna flip it, sear the other side, and then I'm gonna try to sear the edges. I wish I had my my torch from work, because if I had my torch from work, I would just torch the whole thing and sear it that way. This is really good. And you know what? It's clean. There's nothing there's nothing bad that's in there. Got two minutes left. Take that lid off of that. Show you what this looks like inside there. I'm going to do a video here in a little bit as well on uh, big, giant, massive, thick strips. So, let me flip this around so you can see my face. I mean, if you don't mind. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, when I first started carnivore, I thought I needed vitamin C because I started getting some bruising um, on my ribs. And then I would get some bruising on my legs when I would bump into the weights and stuff at the gym because, you know, I like to lift heavy weights. And when I'm grabbing the plates off the rack and I'm turning them around and I'm throwing them on the bar and I'm doing it over and over again, I would bump myself sometimes. And when I first started carnivore, it was like I got bruised really easy and I didn't know what it was. And particularly, a lot of people think that's vitamin C deficiency because what vitamin Z does is it strengthens the collagen that supports the capillaries. And that bruising, they say, is what comes from not having enough vitamin C. But really, like one serving of liver, one time a week, supplies you enough vitamin C for the entire week's worth of vitamin C. So if you just wanted to chop up some liver in little pieces and freeze it, and then maybe, say, once or twice a week or three times a week, just pop some frozen liver in your mouth and swallow it, you won't even taste it. Let me flip this over. Let me show you what it looks like real quick. It turned out perfect. So yes, to answer your question, you do destroy some of the nutrients cooking uh, meat in general. Vitamin C is typically needed when you have 
a diet that's high in glucose. Let me go ahead and set this timer. I'll put it for like like seven minutes. Let it go. So vitamin C is typically needed when you have a diet that has that's high in glucose. But if you're not eating like a lot of sugars and starches and fibers and stuff like that, you don't really have a problem taking the trace vitamin C that's in food and utilizing it correctly. So, you know, your transport, if you looked at a, a molecule of vitamin C and a molecule of sugar and a molecule of high fructose corn syrup, almost all of them mimic each other. So when you reduce your glucose level, your body's your body's priority to, to pull glucose from the blood is not there anymore. So almost no vitamin C now looks like high doses of vitamin C because your body doesn't have to have this competition back and forth with vitamin C that's coming from meat. And it can use small amounts in a very efficient form. And you don't have to be jacked up, you know, during the holidays with tons of vitamin C and stuff like that. So it's kind of one of those things where... Uh, if you want to supplement with it, it's not a big deal. You can do it. Nobody's telling you not to. Is it necessary to do it? Not if you're getting maybe just maybe some beef liver or ancestral supplement sells a liver supplement that has vitamin C in it. And they also got a kidney formula that has some DOA that kind of counteracts histamine release and stuff in the body from aged meats and cheeses and things like that. But I would just have liver once or twice a week just chop up one little one or two ounce serving in little cubes and freeze it if you don't like the taste of it. And if you don't mind the taste of it, you can actually chop it up and throw it in with your ground beef. No problem at all. And you don't really have an issue at that point. Let me turn this, I'm gonna turn the meat down a little bit. What I did was I took a, um, a package of chicken liver, a package of chicken gizzards, uh, I took a little bit of beef liver, and maybe even some lamb heart if you have an international store you could chop it up and kind of put it in the pressure cooker for an hour or two and let it pressure cook and make it real real soft and you make a pate out of it and then you could take some of that pate every once in a while and put it on your steaks and stuff and it's it tastes phenomenal it's delicious and you don't even have to worry about vitamin c at that point because you're getting plenty of it through your food but no i'm not worried about vitamin c on cardboard i just needed to go through that adjustment phase Back when I was getting those little bruises and try to worry about where I was going to get my vitamin C from. And at the time, I just kind of jumped into carnivore and was doing it the doc, Dr. Sean Baker way where he was just mainly eating meat, 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 meat all the time. And that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but I was missing other nutrients. So I started adding in some organs every once in a great while. And now I've been doing it so long, I don't even really need them anymore. I just eat meat and organs once or twice a month. And I'm fine. My labs are completely fine. I have no deficiencies, no nothing. But it took time of building that up in my system and changing my whole gut biome and my flora to basically adjust and move to a more meat, organ-based diet. Let's flip this around. Just trying to seal up all the edges.
And now that I've got that out of there, you could go ahead and just strip that down and just take that bone right out of that back section right there. It'll do fine. But just for purposes of what we're doing here, I'm going to leave it in there. And now once my, I'm up on my minute here, so I'm going to turn the timer off. And now I'm going to take that skillet, the whole skillet, and I'm going to put it right in the oven at 400 for about 8 to 10 minutes. This is supposed to be a holder and I keep leaving it on there and it makes this thing hot and then you can't grab the skillet. take this and throw this in the oven happy new year you then if you eat four ounces you're more than good set the timer on that move my phone over a little bit more I would normally be using a computer but I have to be over here cooking so the phone is the next best bet for me to go live a lot of people were actually suggesting against me getting a real big fancy camera because it's hard to go live on a real big fancy camera while you're doing this stuff unless you're on a laptop or you're carrying something around with you and I thought what better to do it because these new phones now they record it pretty high quality compared to what it is why not just you keep using the phone instead of you know buying a $1,500 camera it's not like I'm out vlogging in public and stuff so it's kind of why I'm doing this now the way I'm doing it set this timer on eight minutes it's on eight minutes right now and then um, where a lot of questions come from on a carnivore diet is you know how do I do I have to track anything on a carnivore diet and the answer to that is no, you don't have to track anything. Some people like keeping up with their fat and their protein macros, so they do like to track, and it keeps them accountable, which that's completely fine. But a carnivore diet is not about that. A carnivore diet is just about eating bioavailable nutrients from animals. Now, some people say is cream cheese a part of a carnivore diet. Ideally, that would not be because that has to be highly processed. And a carnivore diet is thought of to be more of a primal source, something that you would find naturally if you killed an animal or something like that and you ate it. Salt is something we need. Meat is something we need. Organs every once in a while, every once in a while, I specify, is something that we need. Hydration, so drinking some water every once in a while is something that we need. But going into cream cheese and cheeses and stuff like that, people are like, well, I'm having all these reactions on a carnivore diet and I ask them what they're eating and then they say I'm eating all these aged cheeses and these processed sausage meats and stuff like that and I have to remind them do you have allergies and they say well yeah allergy season comes around I do have reaction to different things or do you know that histamines mimic allergies your body already produces histamine and now you're eating these high histamine foods such as processed aged cheeses and meats and stuff like that and you're basically overloading your histamine that you're putting in your body and you're over exerting that allergic reaction. So if you just eat more clean, fresh meats and not so many aged cheeses and meats that have sat in the refrigerator for days on end before you eat them, you're going to notice that you lower your histamine uh, level and the garbage can doesn't fill up so much and there's no spillage. So now you don't feel as bad, you're not getting a skin reaction as much. And you can do very well on a carnivore diet, but the whole premise behind it is eating a more primal style carnivore diet. More of a natural, fresh organ, meat, water, salt, and eating plenty of it. The people that have to stress so much about counting things and stuff like that are simply the ones that normally cause too much of a problem for themselves. And those stress levels, the cortisol levels, just am I doing this right? The reaction to the lifestyle in general causes them to stall out on their weight loss and getting healthy and stuff like that and now 
they want to start adding other things in to make them feel good like coffee and stuff like that which is not a big deal some carnivores do that but you're taxing your adrenal glands to the extent cortisol levels are jacked up all the time just back up a second keep it simple eat meat eat organs drink water salt your food live your life that's as simple as it gets by doing that for a long period of time you will start to reset your metabolism you will start to reset your gut flora you'll heal your gut lining a lot of leaky gut people with leaky gut conditions like that are the ones that normally notice the most with the allergic reactions the histamine reactions the skin conditions the arrhythmia of the heart the shallow breathing or the deep breathing the fast heartbeat or the slow heartbeat and nothing kind of feels normal anymore it's because you're mixing yourself up so long you haven't just stuck to meat organs salt and water for a period of time let's just say give it a good 60 to 90 day block of doing nothing but that the utmost eliminating most natural most bioavailable way and then start adding some things back in oh i want to try some avocado okay you put some avocado back in your diet now what ends up happening my skin's kind of red and i'm getting itchy and my sh my breath is shallow that is a histamine reaction avocados are high in histamine it's something that you probably don't want in your body you don't agree with it maybe the next person does but you don't cut it out a week two weeks back to carnivore water salt organs meat i want to try something else i'm going to add some broccoli into my diet i had some broccoli and i felt okay but i was a little off broccoli is another one of them that does have some histamine response to it it does have high oxalate count to it that's a symptom of you eating something that your body doesn't agree with let me go ahead and cut that out for a little bit cut that out of your diet go back to a week or two of organs water salt meat okay today i had a little bit of uh some brussels sprouts and i felt pretty decent okay so i can see maybe i can have some brussels sprouts i don't have no reactions to my skin my breathing my arrhythmia my muscle cramping and stuff like that i feel like maybe it did help me lose the bathroom a little, use the bathroom a little bit more and it actually reacted well with me that's something that you can probably put on your menu now of if i want a vegetable maybe i can have some brussels sprouts mark it down brussels sprouts don't really seem to have give me a problem go to your next thing reset yourself for another week or two and play this game with yourself over and over and over again and you will build a menu from top to bottom of things that your body likes and it doesn't like you've just now created what some people pay hundreds of dollars to have a lab or a facility do by testing your food sensitivities you've just done the same thing at a much higher more bioavailable level and saved yourself a ton of money in the process so by doing that is your name rich i know i see R R C H. my name's rich so if there are riches here hello i don't know anyway you've just reset yourself by doing that so you pay all this money to have these testing labs do that and you come to find out a lot of them aren't even accurate or you can do it yourself and you can know what's going on by your symptoms by re by your reactions to things and figure out your problem at the source where it's at a lot of people, you know, they eat sardines and olive oil and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden they get these skin reactions on their face is turning red. They feel hot by the time they get to work or after lunch. You know, they had just a uh, can of sardines on a keto diet. You might think that's normal. But even a keto diet, even though it's healing, it's a very high histamine type diet. There's a lot of high histamine foods on a keto diet. And a lot of people stress themselves out, out, out on a keto diet for so long. And they might go three or four months before they even start losing weight. And a lot of that is because they're eating such high histamine foods. And if they learn to eat a low histamine keto style diet, which I'm thinking I want to create a program for because there's not one out there that's really well put together, then they notice they start with, without the symptoms and stuff like that, they start losing weight quicker. A lot of people say, oh, you need more fat, put some avocado in your diet. And then all of a sudden you, you start realizing I'm not losing anything. Um, I've got it actually... I'm going to pull it out right now, and I'm at one minute mark on it, so if you stick around, you'll be able to see it whenever I pull it out of the oven. Um, so basically, you get to a point where you become your own detective. You become your own doctor, your own scientist, your own critic, and there's nobody that's going to be able to beat that. When you look at your body and how you react to food as you're doing it, that's going to be the very best way of keeping a chart, keeping your foods, knowing yourself, because we're all so different. So that in itself is how you're going to figure out whether or not a carnivore diet is for you, whether or not the foods are causing the conditions, and 2020 is going to be the best year for you because you're going to 
Watch this video. You're going to learn a little bit about yourself and then you're going to start taking notes. You're going to create your own food list and you're going to be your own best critic, doctor, scientist, whatever you want, and you'll figure out where your food sensitivities are by doing that very thing. Everything that you need in life, you can find in a steak has got all kinds of vitamins and minerals and stuff in it that people don't even know about. Yes, they are more in a trace form, but when you reduce the sugar, the glucose, the starches, the, all the other junk that's going into your body, you don't need all that. I'm not a doctor. I've just been doing this since I'm 17 years old and I'm going to be 34 this month. So I've been teaching people a lot on social media. I started this at 404 pounds. I'm down to two, 272 right now. And I got all the way down to 250 and I had too much loose skin so I went back and I started losing weight. Let's go ahead and pull this out real quick. Yeah, baby. There we are. There she is. I did do some fasting to lose, so I won't I won't deny that. I did do a lot of fasting. The longest I've been so far is uh I did some fasting to lose a lot of the skin, but then I also started wanting to build some muscle. I was already a previous power lifter in the military, and I wanted to uh, kind of get my life back together in that aspect, so I went that route. And um, Let's go ahead and take that off that skillet. I don't want that on that skillet because it's going to continue cooking that steak on that skillet like that. I want to take it off so it will actually set and rest and cool down some. I know it's plastic and we shouldn't be putting food and stuff on plastic, but again, this is a operating, working household. And we don't do everything perfect like everybody else does, but we're going to act like we're normal today. Just let it sit here and rest and I'm going to continue talking. Let me, let me put this on here for at least five minutes before I cut into it. At least five minutes. I should be doing it about the same time that it was in the oven is what I would like to do. But I'm just going to do it for today's purposes, five minutes. Oh yeah, I use the sous vide too, but this method of cooking meat, I find I even like better than my sous vide. I like the old traditional, old school way of doing things. I like a skillet, I like a cast iron pan, you know, a good quality cast iron pan, good salt, meat, and leave it alone. What's up? I'm about to flip this camera around if you want to be in the screen. No. I can't swim. Okay. Let me flip this around. <laughs> Don't fuck it up. Calm down. <laughs> it's just big. Looks like a fucking animal. You're going to be right in it. You're going to... I dumped this with you. Are you still live? Dude, I'm live right now. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not pause. You can't pause. Okay. So basically when I started, I was right at 404 pounds and I was doing keto. And the first three months I lost, um, I would say about 45 pounds and then things started to slow down. And then I started, I lost another 20 pounds and it took me another three or four months. And everybody's not the same. There's a lot of people. I used to have admins on my... I have an admin on my group. It took her almost five months to even start losing weight because there was so much going on in her body digestively. And you don't know how much time I spent on the phone with her trying to keep her calm, trying to just tell her it'll be okay, just give it time, let yourself heal. And the main thing was she had to get in good quality foods to start helping that, that gut lining of hers. Her leaky gut was so bad that she didn't realize how much work she actually had to put in before 
she got to a point where she could actually start losing weight again. And I spent a lot of time with her just because she wanted to give up. She wanted to try something else. And I kept coaching her and coaching her and coaching her and saying, just stay with it, stay with it. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the first month was like 20 pounds. And then she lost 15 pounds. And then she lost another 20 pounds. And she was like, oh, my God, it actually worked. And I was going to give up. And I said, I told you, it's not a miracle when you, this stuff just works. You got to get good quality food going back into your body to fix so many years of what you've messed up. And it doesn't happen in a week. It doesn't happen in two weeks. It doesn't happen in 30 days. Sometimes it takes lots of time for your body to build up these nutrients and heal. Uh, whenever you whenever you eat good quality food like good meat and you good organs and stuff like that, your body has to start building those tissues around the, or, or around the ligaments, around the tendons. All that stuff has to heal. When I had my surgery from, uh, I got hurt in Iraq and um, I come home. And they did a repair. They went in. They rebuilt my knees and everything like that. And they used cadavers. And they were telling me how long I was going to heal. It was going to take for me to heal from the surgery. But I knew being on a low-carb, keto, carnivore-style diet, I would get plenty of collagen, plenty of B, B vitamins. I would be getting plenty of protein and stuff like that. So my healing time from the surgery, they said, because of how extensive it was, would be 12 to 15 months of like full recovery. I was... I was actually fully recovered in seven months up walking around and actually starting to jog and things like that. But the full recovery, like overall for me to start lifting weights and getting my muscles back right and stuff like that, it probably took 12, 13 months. And, but by then I had already started wanting to give up. So I basically let myself go and I started eating McDonald's and White Castle and all that. I, I did that for a few years and I said, you know what? I looked at myself a couple years ago and I said, you can't keep doing this, man. I wasn't getting a girlfriend. You know, girls weren't interested in me. My my work productivity was slowing down. My efficiency was slowing down. I was having impotency issues. I was becoming a diabetic. And I said, even at 404 pounds, I still had decent numbers lab-wise. So I never really had bad numbers. And that's why we have to look at things differently than each other. Your recommendations or how you do things is never going to be the exact same it would be unwise for me to come to you and say, this worked for me, so this is going to work for you. It doesn't work that way. A lot of the keto groups, a lot of the keto doctors, the carnivore doctors, they, they put out recommendations that are general recommendations. And some people interpret those recommendations as rule of thumb or this is how it has to be and that's not how it has to be at all. These are general recommendations. How I do things is not going to work for you the same way. All right, let's cut into this thing. I don't know why this thing keeps doing that. I can turn it around and it wants to fight me. All right, it's rested about five minutes. Get you a good knife. I'm gonna use this little small carving knife. This is a this knife is actually a Chicago cutlery set. I love Chicago cutlery. I wonder if I should use my big knife for this. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Where's it at again? It's up. It's above, above the sink, right? It's above the sink, right? Or did we put it over in the big cabinet? I'm gonna bring out the good chef's carving knife. This is uh, this knife I showed you guys not too long ago when I bought this knife. This knife was on sale for about $165, but Bed Bath & Beyond was bringing out Henkel's new, new line, and they went ahead and marked everything that was expensive off. This knife still on the internet is about $129.99 for this knife. And I got it for 75% off and then another 10% for clearing. So I ended up picking up this $165 knife for literally 27 bucks.
We'll just cut into this. Ooh, like butter, baby. Look at that. Oh my God. Wow. Holy moly. Just like butter. Look at that. I'm not even pushing on this knife. I'm just barely running this knife across that and just cutting right through it. It don't get no better than that, folks. If you didn't want to slap your mama before, when you bite into this, you're going to want to slap your mama. That's how good this is. It's like a party in your mouth and everybody's coming. You're going to slap your mama when you eat this. Woo-wee! Mmm. Mm, mm 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 My gosh. That's so good it'll make your sticker peck out. Mm mm mm. Holy moly, look at that. That is perfect. Why? How come you can't watch it? I hope you're not vegan. Because this channel is about anti-vegan. <laughs> okay, I see now. I see now. Man, that's good. Holy moly. If it didn't come out better, I'm. this is probably the best I've ever made it. That's like butter. I'm not even pushing on this knife and it's just like, look, just literally just cutting right through that. That's a good knife. That's either a good knife, or that's a good good job cooking it, or it's both. I'm just barely touching that. Just right through. Look at that. Oh my god. I've never used this knife before, so this is the first time. I actually just literally took it out of the package so I could do this with you guys. Hoo-wee! Man, that's good. And the reason you let it rest is so it starts to soak in its juices. Because it'll want to be pushing them out because of all the heat. But as it rests and cools back down, it'll it'll try to pull that juice back in. If you don't know, now you know. I wish, I wish Vegan Games would use this video for something so everybody could see how juicy this is. Mm -mm -mm. I can't wait for my channel to grow big enough for Vegan Games to start talking crap about me so people can see all this delicious food that they're missing out on. Look at that pile of ribeye right there. All right, now we're going to try it. Like butter. Flip it around. Whew. This should be the new thumbnail. Mm. My God. This is unbelievable. I can't. I mean, it don't get no better than this. The flavor that's in this right now with the salt and the oil and stuff and how the pan was treated and how it was cooked. It don't get no better than this. That's all I got for you guys. Unless there's something else you want to talk about right now. We can go ahead and close this out and I'm going to enjoy my steak. Or I'm going to keep eating it and you guys can ask questions. What is it? What do you want to do?
<laughs> I sniff my armpits wet. <laughs> Man, some of the people that come on my video sometimes. You know, I don't hate vegans, but what I don't like is I had a vegan girl talking to me. I support vegan keto. And the reason, here, here's the thing. I support vegan keto because it's people stepping in the right direction on getting healthier. I support all types of eating. I support all types of eating. I don't discriminate against vegans. I don't... Um, There's these <clears throat> well, I can't comment on all that stuff. Everybody believes what they want to believe. Um, I I don't let me get back to my thoughts on this. Um, I don't I don't discriminate against any type of eating. Um, the reason I don't do that is because I think that everybody deserves the right to practice how they want to. But what I don't uh, support is I don't support people teaching other people non-nutritional very bad types of diet that are not good for their health I know a vegan diet is not good for people's health I know what happens and what I see on a vegan diet is not good for people that's why I don't support veganism I don't support their right to it's not that I don't support the right to do it because I do support that right I don't support veganism at, in itself at, being vegan is one thing but practicing veganism is completely different. I don't like veganism. A vegan diet is not healthy in my opinion. But I'm not going to ever talk down about a vegan diet in itself. That's what they do. And if they came across that conclusion themselves, that's fine. What I don't support is the medical industry talking about... You know, quick question, does heat get rid of B12? Anytime you cook meat in a skillet. You're breaking down all of its nutrients. You're losing all of its bioavailability. But it has so much of it as it is that it's always going to be more superior than any type of vegetable or fruit because of how your body interacts with the bioavailable nutrients that's in it. So yes, you will lose some B12. You're going to lose some other types of nutrients that's there. Um, that's why I try to keep mine more on the rare side. It, you know... A vegan diet is fine if you come to that conclusion on your own. What I have a problem with is medical providers that promote it, knowing that it's not bioavailable. I also have a problem with people taking a vegan diet and making it out to be some kind of ideology and then practicing veganism and then saying everybody should be vegan. I have a problem with that. Uh, once you start living off of an ideology and promoting something based on an ideology rather than facts or what is actually bioavailable to people, that's what I have a problem with. So I promote a very sensible, very livable, very common sense type of diet because I know people can digest that. I have watched Sverage before. Um, Sverage is a little out there to me. Uh, I think that's, I think he's bad for the face of carnivore for the simple fact that he gets too confrontational with people. He cuts down people way too much. He's gotten physical on several altercations with people in public. He does not understand the complete science behind why carnivore works for people, but he still promotes it and talks about it as if he knows the nutritional basis, which he doesn't. A lot of the stuff that he promotes is off the top of his head. But I support him in doing his thing because it's his right to do his thing. I don't like him representing a carnivore-style diet for the simple fact that he's just out there, man. He's just out there and he's got his own following with people that like that type of thing. And that's their right to do that. And I'm not going to talk bad about them. Um, Frank, the same way. Frank's got his own type of following and people like the fact that Frank rips everybody apart and tears everybody down. Because Frank wants to be thought of as the god of carnivore. That's people's right to do that. That's Frank's right to do that and make his content because he's going to draw his crowd in that way. That's his right to do those types of things. But me, when it actually comes down to the, to the basis of understanding the science behind it without having to go back to a textbook, relating to people on how to help them on a more one-on-one -on -one basis, 
rather than trying to take their money for some coaching or something like that, I think people like me, like Bart, like many of us, like you guys that have done this long term, that understand what it takes to relate to people and, and coach people and help people understand the science behind it without having to get into all the monetization aspect are better for the community in general than those trying to make a living off of it and trying to monopolize on it and trying to make more and more and more and more money off of it. You have to think the same people before that were telling us not to, um, I, I have went hunting before. I've, I've never killed anything myself because I've only went a few times, but I'm, I'm okay with hunting. I think that we should be doing more of that. Uh, I have a I have a firearm card. I'm going to go get my concealed carry soon. Um I've done all the I'm I'm all about the the American way of doing things and that's just how I am. Um Where was I even going with any of that? Let me see what this question was here. <laughs> I have a catapult in my head. Well, do your thing if that's what you do. Um, Bob here says, what do you do to ensure you get plenty of potassium and the amount of potassium relative to sodium intake? So I find that, um, yeah. <laughs> I find that potassium levels actually store in the body longer. So a lot of people try to reach this high three, four, five thousand milligram of potassium every single day. And if that's what you have to have, you got to eat more. The only way that you're going to be able to do that is by mixing up different types of food in your diet. Let's just say 16 ounces of pork has like, I think it's like 900 or 1200 milligrams of potassium. When you, cons when you compare that to beef, it's substantially less. People don't like eating pork. I've actually even heard... You know, like Sean Baker tell people, maybe stay away from so much pork or something like that. I like pork. Pork doesn't give me a problem. And if I know I'm low on potassium and I haven't been keeping up on my beef enough to keep my potassium levels up, I'll eat a little bit of pork throughout the week to jack up the potassium levels even more. Like the other night I had two big, like 10 ounce pork steaks that were pretty heavy and pretty thick. That's a lot of potassium in those two pork steaks. And now I won't have pork for like, you know, another week. That's just how I do things. I'll have this, you know, these rib tips I made today. They got plenty of potassium in them. But my sodium intake is the most critical. A lot of people, um, a lot of people focus too much on the potassium levels. Your body actually tries to retain potassium. It doesn't actually shed potassium like it does sodium. Sodium is the most critical mineral for the body. The mineral electrolyte balance is, is, is critical. So when you go to the gym and you, like I've said before, you spend 15 to 30 minutes in the gym and you're already taxed, you're ready to go home, you just can't keep going anymore, you feel like you're going to fall out or you're, you're that tired, your sodium levels are depleted. They're completely low. Sodium, I think, is the most critical component in any of this and people often neglect that. They worry more about magnesium. They're worried more about potassium. It's not. Sodium is the most critical component out of all this, I think. If you listen to Stan Efforting, the White Rhino, he talked about how he went to his powerlifting meet and how in practice he pulled 815-pound deadlift no problem. And he says, I, I get down there to get set up. I mean, he says, I get down there to get set up and I go down to grab the bar. And he says, I'm going down there to grab the bar. And he said, I start to get my butt back and I started to pull. And when I went to pull, it was like my whole body cramped up. I, I just locked up. And he said, I started... I almost fell over and he said the problem with that was Mark Bell came up to me immediately and he said let's start loading him up because they were about to take him to the hospital he said let's start loading him up with sodium tabs right now and he said they put like a thousand milligrams of sodium two thousand milligrams of sodium and I started drinking my water and he said the next time I was up within that little 15 20 minute span he said I had him up increase it to like 860 pounds and he said I went over there and I started to, to get set up for my squat rack or my, my deadlift pull, and I noticed that I was fine. My my movement was better, and I noticed I felt completely different. And he said, I went to pull, and he said, I pull, and I shot that straight up off the ground, and he said, I had no problem at all. He said it was, sodium levels are so critical for anything that happens in your life. It doesn't matter if it's muscle recovery. It doesn't matter if it's Sodium levels in your body actually will give you a better pump going to the gym than some kind of pre-workout because it's that sodium-potassium cross where the cell opens and closes. The cell opens, 
sodium comes in. The cell, the cell closes, opens on the other side. Potassium comes in, and it's this, this cross, this exchange back and forth that happens inside the cell. It's like if you picture a gear opening one way and closing the other way. And if you, if you know what an oil pump is, an oil pump creates this swash style. And in between where the gear comes in and pushes out the other side, it has a suction behind it. And as it has a suction behind it, it also has a force that pushes out. And it comes back in and it pushes back out. And this pump, this rotary pump that actually moves, it will bring suction behind and it will pressure out. Suction behind, pressure out. Well, your cell kind of works similar except it's a swash style design. It opens and closes. Opens and closes and the minerals exchange inside the cell over and over again. That's where you get that pump in the gym That's how you feel that feeling that sensation through your nervous system That's how your body knows that something's going on and it's firing on signals. That's what goes on Sodium is the most critical component to any of that stuff potassium levels are you know, they're they're critical but when it comes down to it sodium levels are going to be the main driver behind the muscle firing, it's going to be the main driver behind the cramping and stuff like that. And then your potassium levels and stuff come after it. I think if your potassium levels drop too low and your movement is what's like, say you, you go to pick up the garbage, you, you bend over to pick up the garbage and you stand up and you're like, oh man, my hamstring's cramping up. This is a movement based cramp. It's a movement based exercise. Now you have to start saying, ah, sodium potassium levels a little bit off. My, my sodium's fine. Well, I know it's got to be potassium then. So, potassium levels are your movement. If your sodium levels, if you know your sodium levels are fine, and you don't have to focus on that, if everything's getting salted, and you're having four, or five, six, six thousand, seven thousand milligrams of sodium per day, a lot of athletes are up to seven, eight thousand milligrams of sodium per day because they have to have that to train. But say that movement, when you pick that up and you actually stood up and you're like, oh, my hamstring. You are automatically, no, I had 6,000 milligrams of sodium today. Why am I cramping up? Potassium. Potassium is the movement deficiency that causes the cramping. If you go to sit down and you're laying in bed with your wife or something like that, I think it's potassium. It's either potassium or magnesium is the movement. You might just re-verify that. I get them mixed up sometimes because I get too excited. I love doing this stuff. I love talking about this stuff. The movement type is the potassium deficiency. Now, say you're laying in bed, and you're next to your loved one and stuff like that, and all of a sudden, your, your calves start cramping up, you're getting those, those leg cramps at night, all of a sudden, you run to the kitchen, and you, you down some pickle juice. All of a sudden, that restless leg syndrome, it quits. You're fine, you're not cramping anymore, that could be from a number of things. So There's high sodium levels in there, there's high potassium, or not high, it's not high in pickle juice, I think it's some potassium levels in there. Or, you know, you have to look at magnesium. A lot of your resting, like sitting on the couch type stuff where you're watching a movie and all of a sudden your feet start to cramp, your legs start to cramp, maybe you're getting some cramps in your forearms, magnesium type deficiency. That's when you know your, if you, if you know your sodium levels are fine and there are other parts that may, you, you may have neglected, magnesium, potassium, that's where a lot of, that's where you need to start looking. But if your sodium levels are constantly you, and you're thinking to yourself, man, that can't be the problem. I, I recently learned that anaerobic exercise can be putting stress on your heart. Apparently, you're supposed to do 180 minus your age to work out your heartbeat to be trained. Uh, I mean, there is some truth to that, but it's not written in stone. So, uh, 180 minus my age would put me at, I'm a, I'll be 34 this month. And that'll put me at, what, 146? 146 is actually a good number for me. If I stay between 145 and 146, I actually feel really good and get a really great workout off of that. I actually, I actually, if I go from one station to the next and I'm doing interval type training, I actually, if I can keep my numbers right about 140, 145, 146, I actually get, I actually maximize my workout at that level. So I can see how a lot of that could be true. Uh, you know, I don't mind people recommending doctors, but I'm getting to the point now where I don't even, I don't even mess with doctors anymore. I have a few doctors that I like to, to look at, but you know, I've been doing a lot of this stuff so long now that I've, I've been doctored out. 
I mean, I've been doctored out by too many of the doctors in the industry that I do a lot of my own stuff now. Like I do a lot of my own little groups where I take like right now at starting Sunday night, I have a weigh in and it'll start Monday. Uh, it'll start Monday for 14 days and I'm doing a carnivore keto style movement 14 day challenge and I'll monitor people for almost 14 days and I'll get to see exactly how things are happening, operating with them and I'll get to be a part of their life for 14 days and then the next one will be 30 days and then we might even do a 60 day where I get to talk to these people every single day. I'm doing a lot more of my own stuff now just for the simple fact that I'm not really keen on following a lot of the doctors and stuff anymore. Everybody's got their own ideas on stuff so um, I'll keep them in mind. Let me see that name again. Dr. Doug McGuff. I'll, I'll check it out. I mean, it's just, I've been burnt by a lot of the doctors and putting a lot of trust and stuff in them and then come to find out they're actually not that knowledgeable at all. But something special like that, I can see how that would be a benefit to know. Um, anyway, I don't know. There were some other questions or whatever. So do I support vegan keto? I do support vegan keto. Do I think it's all that healthy? Absolutely not. Um, but it can be done and people can be successful on it. I've done it. I did it for almost two weeks as an experiment because I wanted to see if I could keep going just so I could talk about it. The first week I lost about seven pounds. The second week I lost four pounds, but I felt so depleted energy wise that I just couldn't keep going. I had to quit because I almost felt like I was falling out while I was walking and stuff. I would just simply get out of bed to, to go to the shower and my energy levels felt like they were just completely trash. And I needed protein. I needed good sources of vitamin B12 for mitochondrial function, energy production. My ATP probably conversion um, was way off. There was a lot of stuff that needed to change that I simply just did not have the time to allow myself to change and go through that adjustment phase. And it was just something I couldn't continue doing. I didn't. I just chose not to do it. Mm. So, if you are new to carnivore and digestive issues are a concern for you, um, a lot of people will say, well, I've been doing a carnivore diet now and I haven't went to the bathroom in a week. It's probably normal for you. If you're not feeling pressure in the belly area, if you're not feeling pain, that's fine. Leave it alone. Then all of a sudden, the second week, they say, man, I got diarrhea every single day. Your whole flora is changing in your digestive tract. Everything has to convert, switch, rebuild. You're, basic, you're basically rebirthing a different type of bacteria in your digestive tract that has to adhere to a new complete lifestyle. I went almost five to six weeks with nothing but diarrhea every single day. And it was super, super uncomfortable. But the six and a half, seventh week, it all went away. It was solid. It was little bits of movement every couple days. Like every other day, I would go a little bit. And then it was just a little bit each day. And my body became normalized. And my flora changed. My digestive tract changed. I felt like a million bucks. I didn't crave anything else other than animal products. I went and got my labs tested. Completely fine across the board. I'd lost like in a three or four month period of being carnivore, I lost like almost 40 pounds. And my doctor was like, how is your vitamin C levels fine and your, your, your cholesterol is completely fine. My LDL was down to 89, my HDL was up to 62, my triglycerides are at like 52. She was like, dude, this is phenomenal. How is this A1C was like 5.0? It did, my A1C came up a little bit from being on keto because I am eating you know, substantially more fat cholesterol and stuff in general so my numbers did come up a little bit on my a1c but she said I, I could not ever complain about this your lab panels are perfectly fine completely normal across the board my my creatinine was normal my crp levels were way 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 low so there was no inflammation in my body um my my egr my egrp was normal all that stuff was normal so a lot of people were saying, you know, oh you're gonna get sick and you're gonna have all these high cholesterol numbers i'm not a lean mass hyper responder I'm not one of them people that respond to a ketogenic carnivorous lifestyle like a lean mass hyper responder would. My body functions absolutely 100% normal when it comes to how it adjusts to vitamin levels, mineral levels, cholesterol, and stuff like that. I've never had any problems like that. I had my calcium plaque score done, zero, no arterial placking, no nothing. So there's like a number of things that um, 
people were telling me I was going to have to worry about when I started this, when it came to fruition and I actually started testing things, I had nothing to worry about, absolutely zero. So that's uh, in a nutshell. It just takes some adjusting and being on a lifestyle long enough for you to really get used to something new. And my doctor, she, after she was skeptical for a while and she seen me lose like the first 70 pounds, she was like, okay, can you make one of them keto pizzas for me? And I went and made her a fathead pizza. I make the best fathead pizzas out there, I think. I think I make a pizza so good fathead that it's almost as good as regular pizza. But, you know, people that create their own recipes, they often think that, so that's normal. I want to toot my own horn on that. Um... I made her a pizza. I took it to her at her office, and she was like, "Man, this is really good. I could I could actually eat this and not even feel like I was on a diet." And I said, "What if I made you some more food like this more often? Would you consider doing it?" So I made my doctor three or four keto meals. I took them out to her, and uh, she loved them. She started doing it on her own. She lost 45 pounds. She's a Puerto Rican lady, kind of susceptible to a little bit heavier weight because of her family lifestyle, her genetic trait, and stuff like that. Puerto Rican women seem to be seem to be a little thicker on the thicker side. African American women, based on genetic trait and stuff, if you actually look at the history of it, each one of them are susceptible. Different ethnicities are susceptible to different conditions at a different rate, and these are all fact. This is all something that's been proven. And with her getting on the keto diet, she lost 45 pounds. And the next time I seen her, she was all slim and stuff. And I was like, Wow, where are, where'd you go? And she said, I love it. And I asked her, I said, Would you ever would you ever talk to your colleagues about any of this? Would you ever tell them that you're on a ketogenic diet? And she said, no, I really can't. I mean, the standard medical practices would push me out of my job at the VA. I could never talk about this. I could never tell people how much I like my fatty coffee in the morning with my butter and my, my heavy whipping cream. And I said, man, it's really sad, man. It's sad that you can't even be honest about something that you're experiencing and you're really healthy on. And she said, unfortunately, that's just how the medical industry works. It's bought and paid for, and that's exactly what it is. So, time to eat my steak. Good talk, guys. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. And uh, if you have any comments, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And I am going to eat my steak now. Happy New Year and be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your week as well. Thanks, Bob. Nice meeting you. I sniff my armpits. I don't know what your name is. I would call you by your name. Shell, thank you for being here as well. Bob, thanks for being here. Real, real results. I really appreciate you guys being here. Okay, John. I remember that. Thank you. I see you guys.